There is something quite unusual about the way Matt Bellamy, the singer and songwriter of Muse, writes his chord progressions. It's gonna be a wild episode, but I'll warn you right now, if you thought power chords were too simplistic, you should probably turn this video off right now. What's up everyone, it's Fredo Fantasm from Holistic Songwriting, the songwriting coach with a beard. Welcome to season two of the artist series where we look at the biggest rock artists in the world and what we can learn from them. This time, we're taking a close look at Muse and specifically how they use chords in their songwriting. But before we do, let's put everything in perspective and first talk about who the artist is. Without understanding what the artist is trying to achieve, it doesn't make much sense to sift through data. So as always, let's start with the image. So put on your thinking caps and riddle me this. What emotions does Muse evoke in you? Pause this video, think of maybe three or four words, then come back to me. So hit the space bar in three, two, one, now. And here's what I came up with. First, they sound clever, smart, sophisticated. It's not background music and it actively seeks your attention. Second, and forgive the phrase, they sound full of wonder and excitement, almost excessively so. A lot of their songs feel like you're floating through space or cliff diving. And lastly, tension. While listening to their music, you feel constantly on edge, suspended in midair. Now, there are some similarities with our previously covered band Radiohead. They're both British and have that British look and sound, and they use tense, high-pitched melodies over the occasional odd chord. So where can we draw a line between these two bands? What makes them different? Let's refine our image of these bands a little more. I promise we're gonna get to the good stuff right after this, but for now, take another second, pause the video and think, what are the differences between Muse and Radiohead? And here's what I've come up with. And this should go without saying, but obviously none of this is meant as criticism or suggesting that one band is better than the other. I just wanna clear up the details here. While Muse certainly has some challenging harmonies, they rarely completely fall out of key and therefore don't have that sense of counterculturism like Radiohead does. There is a noticeable and sometimes even explicit influence from classical composers like Bach or Rachmaninoff, composers which are so baked into our Western minds that they hardly seem contrarian, even if we hear some of their more challenging chord progressions. Secondly, Radiohead feels darker, more personal, a creative mind that's gone mad. Muse feels less attached, more about big picture stuff. Their lyrical themes are conspiracies and politics, rebellion, and war. This difference in scope shows in the music as well. Where Radiohead's music feels introverted and closed off, Muse sounds like the leader of a rebellion, along with stomping, roomy drums and megaphone vocals. There, now that we got that cleared up, let's see how all of this reflects in the music. This little example really captures a whole lot of what we've been talking about. It sounds clever, classical, tense, and full of wonder. Why is that? Let's take a good look at the harmony here. We're seeing an eight bar chord progression in three fourths that goes up in fourths. This is a kind of sequencing where you take a bunch of chords and repeat them at a different pitch. The same thing can be heard in Knights of Sidonia. We know sequencing from classical music and film scores. So that's already a first hint at Bellamy's influences. Then there's a boatload of notes that outline the different chords, arpeggios. If you played these notes together as a kind of pad, the song would lose all of its clever sound. I think it's fair to say that more notes also sound more sophisticated. And between you and me, the arpeggios you're hearing right now in the backing track, I added those for the same effect, which makes me seem less like a doofus with a beard and more like a smart person with a beard. Why do I keep mentioning the beard? Here's the chords that these arpeggios spell out. The first thing that jumps out is the augmented chords, a rarity in modern pop music. Like all chords, augmented chords have a different effect depending on how they're used. In this case, I would say they are used to make us feel excited, to instill that sense of wonder. Also, I think it's fair to say that this many triads are unusual for the rock genre, where especially in energetic songs like this one, you would expect power chords. Now take a close look at how these chords are led into it's easier to see when we condense everything down to dotted half notes. This is proper classical voice leading. 
where for each chord change, the minimal amount of movements is made within the voices. Here's the next section of the song, condensed down to dotted half notes. To a lot of songwriters and composers out there, this kind of voice leading has become second nature, but it's a fact that with musical education going down, more and more songwriters don't do this. Check out this video from Future Music Magazine where you can see Avicii, rest in peace, show off the piano roll for dancing in my head, and the voice leading is all over the place. Now again, this doesn't mean it's bad, it just has a different sound. So this along with the triads, the sequencing, the augmented chords, and the operatic structure are some of the reasons why Taiko Bao has a classical vibe. And isn't this why Muse sounds sophisticated too? Because even though they are a band of big, bold moves, most of their sound comes from these small movements, where one note is changed one step at a time. In fact, if I were a philosopher, I would probably say that that's how all revolutions start, through small changes. Now, if you were to write a song like this on guitar, you would quickly run into a common problem. Triads and distorted guitars don't sound so good together. That's part of the reason why power chords are the most popular chords in rock bands. As soon as you add the third, the sound becomes unstable and less defined. So how does Muse deal with this problem? The simple answer is, they don't. The harmony in their songs usually doesn't come from the guitar. It comes from other instruments, like the synth in Take a Bow, or the bass in Time is Running Out. Note that both of these don't play actual chords, they essentially play melodies, counterpoints that imply the harmony. Look at this bass lick. First of all, if we ignore the octave jumps, we can see how smoothly the bass walks, using stepwise motion to reach each new chord. And except for the E major chord, all other chords are outlined by this lick. We get the root and minor third of the A minor, the minor seventh and third of the B diminished, followed by a chromatic passing tone going to the E major, and we end on the F and G with the root and fifth, respectively. Let's look at the chords next. We've got a 2-5 in minor, followed by a flat 6, flat 7, 1. These are both very common cadences in classical music as well. This is part of the reason why the bass lick flows so well, but it also instills that classical, sophisticated sound. Let's look at another bass riff, this time from Hysteria. This follows a similar idea as time is running out. Again, we see a lot of notes, which already sounds hysteric, but this time, the bass doesn't play the harmony as much, and there are no stepwise transitions from chord to chord. However, when we leave out the pedal bass, meaning the root notes of the chords, it's easy to see that there is still a melody that moves mostly stepwise, with some loose sequencing for the chord changes. In other words, the bass takes up two roles. It gives us the fundamentals, the bass notes, and it gives us a riff on top of that. So this is a different approach to Time is Running Out, which is why they don't sound the same. Different methods yield different results. And here's yet another example of an intro riff with a lot of notes that uses a different approach entirely. In Reapers, the open strings don't make up the bass notes of the chords, they fulfill different functions in the various chords depending on the notes higher up the string. So what starts out as a D major with the open D string as its root, turns into a G minor over D, then a D major 7 augmented, then a D minor 7, G minor, C minor over G, and C sharp diminished over G. Again, same type of riff, but a different approach and therefore a different sound. Now the question arises, when one of the instruments is playing such an incredibly busy part, what is the rest of the band doing? It's easy to fall into the trap of overloading the arrangement with power chords or another busy pattern. And so, Bellamy writes very simple parts for these secondary instruments. This includes his own vocals, which often stretch out into long notes, thereby not interfering with the main riff. We listen to some of these unobtrusive secondary parts in just a second. It's often where you don't look that the songwriting actually happens. It's an incredibly important skill as a songwriter 
to be able to write parts that don't split our attention away from the main riff. It should also be said that, presumably for the same reason, it's very common for Bellamy to omit any secondary parts in his first verses, as is the case with all three songs that follow. So we're only gonna listen to the second verses of these songs. Let's talk about two more techniques Bellamy likes to use when it comes to harmony. First of all, and I already kind of mentioned this, he loves functional harmony. And so nine times out of 10, he will hear a dominant fifth, so a major chord, in a song set in minor, and typically in a strong position at the end of the chord progression. Similarly, Bellamy is also a big fan of diminished chords. These are typically used to approach the dominant fifth in minor or the tonic in major. So there you have it. Tension, a sense of wonder, and sophistication. I think it's no coincidence that Bellamy likes to write about conspiracy theories. His music sounds just like them, completely ridiculous and over the top, literally augmented, but in a fascinating way with an obsession to detail. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share, subscribe, and let me know in the comments which rock artist you'd like me to do next. Also, while you're here, why not subscribe to the Holistic Songwriting Live channel, where every Monday at 9 a.m. PST, I answer your questions in a live 60-minute Q&A session. This is Friedemann Fendeisen from Holistic Songwriting. Now take care and stay gefährlich.